Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Toolbox Tuesday. Uh, my name is Lyle Janicek, and I am a Senior Regional Planner at SCAG. Uh, our Toolbox Tuesday program provides a range of practical skills and knowledge for local planners, private sector planners, nonprofit staff, academics, and students, uh, with trainings which include uh, the use of computer-based tools uh, and education in uh, practical approaches to timely planning issues. Uh, this session will explore local strategies to manage parking development and design in line with the goals of creating more pedestrian-friendly and less auto-oriented public realms, in particular in conjunction with housing development. Parking strategies can have a direct effect on inducing or minimizing demand for vehicle miles traveled, um, also known as VMT. An oversupply of parking can undermine broader regional goals of creating vibrant public spaces and a robust multimodal mobility system. An abundance of free parking has the effect of incentivizing automobile trips and making alternative modes of transportation less attractive. Today's session includes continuing maintenance credits for AICP members uh, for the American Planning Association, and you can check that out uh, online at the APA's website. Yeah. All right, before we get started, uh, we have a few housekeeping items, as you can see on the screen. Uh, for starters, today's session will run for approximately an hour and a half. Uh, we are recording this session, uh, which will be published in a few days. Um, all participant lines will be muted. Um, and at the end of each presentation, we will offer a brief question and answer session, as well as a webinar question and answer session at the very end. If you have a question during the presentation, feel free to drop it into the chat box, um, and we will bring those up towards the end of that particular presentation um, or as the at the end of the, the session as a whole. Uh, we will log all questions and then voice a selection of them at the end of the presentation. A recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint slides will be available on the SCAG website, um, and we will send a link to everyone who has registered after the event. Now... <clears throat> Our agenda for today includes two presentations, uh, the first being a presentation from city staff at the City of Los Angeles, followed by a presentation from Walker Associates and staff from the City of Beaumont. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our staff from the City of Los Angeles. Uh, Ken Bernstein is a principal city planner for Los Angeles City Planning, where he directs the Office of Historic Resources and the Urban Design Studio. He serves as lead staff member for the city's Cultural Heritage Commission, has overseen the completion of Survey LA, a multi-year citywide survey of historic resources, and has led the creation of a comprehensive historic preservation program for Los Angeles. He has previously directed uh, other policy planning initiatives, including work on general plan and community plan updates, housing policy and transportation planning, he also served for eight years as Director of Preservation Issues for the Los Angeles Conserv Conservancy. He has a master's degree in public affairs and urban and regional planning from Princeton University's School of Public and International Affairs and a bachelor's in uh, political science from Yale University. In addition to Ken, we have Michelle Le uh, Levy, uh, who leads LA City Planning's Urban Design Studio. Her team promotes a more vibrant, walkable and sustainable city through project design, reviews and long range planning. She has directed citywide and neighborhood level policy programs, including the city's first citywide design guidelines, the update of the open space element of the general plan, several mobility complete street plans, as well as affordable housing and transit oriented communities projects. Prior to joining the city of Los Angeles in 2006, Michelle worked for Environmental Defense Fund and the city of New York, and as a project manager for Studio Benevente, architects in Northern California. She has a master's degree in urban planning from Columbia University and a BA in architecture from UC Berkeley's College of Environmental Design. She is currently pursuing professional certification in landscape architecture at UCLA. Uh, with further, without further ado, Ken and Michelle, the stage is yours. Help if I unmute it. Thank you, Lyle. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see such a um, wonderful turnout for this topic on innovative parking strategies. And uh, uh, Michelle and I are, are really pleased to join our uh, uh, colleagues from the city of Beaumont to talk about this topic today. Um, our presentation is going to uh, focus a little bit more narrowly than the Beaumont presentation. Uh, you know, we are kind of in the city of LA, the 800 pound gorilla of the Skag region, a city of 470 square miles and 4 million or so people. 
Um, and uh, we're going to focus largely on uh, a particular tool we've been using, um, an advisory tool related to above ground parking. But we'll set the scene by first talking about some broader um, innovative parking strategies and the, the context that Lyle began to set for parking um, and parking policy. So um, I'll start and then Michelle will uh, pick up with some of the specifics of the um, advisory related to above ground parking. But to start, um, why do we need to address parking? Lyle has touched upon some of this already. Um, the compelling reasons why uh, local government parking policy and the framework that's provided as well at the state level really has a significant impact on our communities. First of all, the cost of parking adds a uh, tremendous burden to the cost of developing housing. The cost is about $55,000 per space. Our existing codes can result in an oversupply uh, of parking in many instances. Uh, many of our codes typically require um, two parking spaces per resident uh, as, a, as a parking minimum. We'll talk about how we're shifting away from parking minimums. There's also the idea and many of you are familiar with as planners and policymakers of induced demand, the idea that parking uh, when made free, when made uh, abundant, uh, actually helps uh, uh, drive demand for parking, induces demand for driving um, in lieu of uh, alternative modes of transportation. There's also the effect that parking has on our physical space and the design of uh, space in our communities, that uh, parking is taking up a great deal of room, uh, physical space that can be used for other beneficial uses in our communities. And the effect that parking has on our streets, that parking ingress and e egress, um, curb cuts and uh, interruptions in uh, uh, consistent street walls, as an example, that all has a detrimental effect on the public realm. So we need to address parking comprehensively. <clears throat> to, to begin, um, there are a number of statewide policies that many of you may be familiar with, both uh, adopted and in the works that kind of set the scene and set the framework for parking reform in California. There's a, a current bill pending, AB 2097, uh, Laura Friedman's bill, that is very significant. I believe last I looked, it has passed the assembly and is still pending, pending before the state Senate. Uh, and that bill would eliminate minimum parking requirements across the state uh, for uh, properties that are within a half mile of high quality transit. We have seen state policy begun to shift in this direction, regardless in recent years with the passage of SB 743, um, which uh, as many of you know, is, is really driving the shift away from level of service and uh, having level of service and uh, congestion drive our transportation mobility policies and shifting to vehicle miles tra uh, traveled or VMT. And looking at parking reductions near transit that have been provided in other adopted state legislation, such as SB 35, and more recently, uh, SB 9, allowing for lot splits and uh, potentially up to four uh, residential units on single family zone properties that is simultaneously um, dealing with parking reductions, particularly when near transit. The um, city of Los Angeles has been building upon some of this state legislation by overall trying to shift from being an auto-centric uh, metropolis and Los Angeles has that image, of course, in the public eye, probably internationally, that we are a city of freeways, a city of the automobile, but really shifting our policies to being a more transit-oriented city. And uh, we've developed a number of new policies, both citywide and more uh, community-based or neighborhood-based that are supporting that policy shift. And uh, we've been addressing parking at a variety of scales, uh, both uh, short and long-term citywide and very neighborhood focused given the diversity of our city. So LA is a city where one size clearly doesn't fit all. Uh, and uh, we have taken that approach. Just to touch upon briefly some of our citywide um, strategies, first um, looking at our general plan, our comprehensive plan uh, for the city our housing element and our mobility element, mobility plan 2035, have had a number of foundational policies supporting some of this new thinking in policy, uh, in, in parking. As an example, our housing element has a policy that's encouraging 
convertible design, uh, encouraging the conversion of above grade uh, parking facilities and particularly in transit rich areas so that they can later be converted to housing. We'll touch more upon that in Michelle's portion of the, the presentation. Um, in addition, zone, specific zoning strategies and uh, uh, code amendments uh, in our zoning code, as an example of that, our bicycle parking ordinance uh, passed a few years ago, really helping to enable the replacement of automobile parking uh, with bicycle parking and uh, in increased incentives in that regard for, again, properties that are located uh, near a major transit stop. Our adaptive reuse ordinance, this actually goes back to um, the late 1990s and was a pioneering ordinance of its kind. That helped incentivize the conversion of historic buildings and older commercial buildings um, to housing. And one of the major uh, incentives as part of that ordinance was really kind of deregulating parking and saying that um, if you're converting an older building to housing, most of those buildings did not have parking on site. You did not need to provide parking. There was no minimum parking requirement. You could utilize parking in the surrounding neighborhood or shared parking arrangements. And then we're also developing a, a, a transportation demand management, TDM uh, ordinance, building upon, again, a couple of decade old uh, uh, TDM policies, but moving to a point system um, that provides much more flexibility, but also builds in considerations about the amount of parking provided in how projects will comply with uh, TDM requirements. So those are some of the citywide policies. Um, in addition to that, some neighborhood-based, uh, more incremental approaches. One of those is our Transit-Oriented Communities Program, or TOC. This was something that was actually required by a ballot measure approved by the voters in Los Angeles that uh, provided some significant incentives and some density bonuses for housing near transit with a tie to uh, affordability, inclusionary housing requirements, but very significant parking reductions and incentives for uh, projects in various tiers in our transit-oriented communities incentives, building upon state-enabled density bonus requirements that have enabled for parking reductions. We've gone farther as well in some of our community plans. Los Angeles has 35 community plans that collectively make up the land use element of our general plan. And probably the most far reaching in terms of parking reform has been our downtown Los Angeles DTLA 2040 plan, which has again moved significantly to deregulate uh, parking or not require uh, minimum parking uh, in the downtown area, which is our most transit rich uh, area of the city. A number of other zoning overlays have uh, taken significant steps related to parking. Our Expo corridor, corridor Transit Neighborhood Plan. This is our um, exposition line, a part of our um, uh, uh, Metro Rail system, has uh, codified uh, shared parking arrangements, has provided for reduced parking where uh, car, car share vehicles are provided, and moved in the direction of unbundling parking. So separating uh, parking requirements, allowing more, much more flexibility, uh, particularly for uh, new housing. And our South Los Angeles CPIO, that means a Community Plan Implementation Ordinance for the South Los Angeles region, has reduced parking for targeted commercial uses for eligible historic resources and also allowed for um, no new parking to be required in conjunction with a change of use. So each of these have taken very different approaches based on um, the uh, transit availability, the specific uh, characteristics of each community. Um, I would also point out that maybe this actually could have been considered a citywide policy, but our citywide design guidelines that were adopted that our urban design studio helped lead uh, uh, some amendments to in 2019 has also taken several steps to provide design guidance on parking, several guidelines and best practices related to, to parking and, above, and the design of above ground parking that Michelle will be speaking to, including enclosing or wrapping podium parking areas with active uses, uh, orienting buildings uh, to uh, uh, you know, ensure that uh, you know, parking is, uh, has visual connections to abutting uh, public rights of way and many other uh, best practices related to the, to the design of parking. Um, so that leads us then to specifically the above grade parking advisory this is not new code, it's not a new ordinance or a requirement, but is an informational document, an advisory that was first 
um, encouraged and adopted by our city planning commissioners. Our city planning commission adopted this in 2016, and they adopted amendments in um, most recently um, in October 2019. And then in October 2021, the city planning commission directed staff to up, update the advisory to accomplish a couple of things. One is to strengthen the relationship of this guidance document to some of the state and citywide policies that I just mentioned, the state laws, as well as a number of these uh, city ordinances and general plan uh, policies around mobility and sustainability. That was one set of recommendations. And another was really to reinforce strategies that further support the adaptability of parking facilities for future conversion to other beneficial uses, um, such as house housing, and to be more specific about some of those strategies. And in uh, strengthening the relationship, again, this, this references some of the policies that I've already mentioned. So we recommended adding a reference to SB 743, the shift to vehicle miles traveled, the mobility plan uh, policy that uh, referenced oversupply of parking. We also have a sustainability plan led by our mayor's office, Mayor Garcetti, that has been uh, really branded as LA's Green New Deal, the sustainability plan 2019. It speaks to uh, a number of far-reaching sustainability policies, and as I mentioned, the citywide design guidelines. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle to uh, walk you through some of the key strategies of the above grade parking uh, uh, advisory. Great, thank you, Ken. And it's great to be here with all of you. We were delighted when SCAG invited us to present on this topic that's very near and dear to us in the Urban Design Studio. Um, so. I'm going to focus in on the recently adopted above grade parking advisory and um, Ken really um, gave an excellent kind of big picture overview of where we are in the city of Los Angeles. Um, and what this advisory does is it really addresses parking from an urban design lens. Um, the uh, advisory is organized into two sections. The first section addresses two priority strategies aimed at strengthening pedestrian first design, which is one of the three organizing principles of our citywide design guidelines. So we developed these citywide design guidelines first, um, and this strategy really supports our objectives of creating a walkable city. The second section addresses strategies that can be used where below grade parking is not feasible. Uh, and while some of these changes, some changes have been made to explain how parking can be effectively screened, this update to the above grade parking advisory really maintains the two highest priority strategies, which are number one, to reduce the overall parking footprint. And Number two, to place parking below ground whenever possible so that above ground building space can be prioritized for people walking and active uses. And we know that oftentimes parking is supplied well above code requirements. And that often results in the need for additional floor levels, which really um, impacts kind of the design of the building and the additional relief that the applicant or you know the project development developer or the applicant might be asking for and oftentimes what we've seen in our work in the in the urban design studio is that above grade levels are dedicated solely to parking uses and what that does is it results in one or more facades of the building that create a blank wall um, or worse uh, that the parking headlights uh, project light and noise onto neighboring properties. So what we're really promoting here is the use of best practices like using our bicycle parking reduction or using mechanical parking to really shrink that footprint. Um, and then with that, you see other benefits as well. So where parking below grade is not feasible, we've identified a few measures to help minimize the impacts of above grade parking. Primarily, the advisory recommends integrating the parking facility into the design and form of the project through intentional site planning. So what this means is that, you know, whether the parking is above or below grade, 
uh, making sure that driveways, for instance, are placed as far away as possible from pedestrian access points to avoid conflicts. And then from an architectural standpoint, incorporating features like artwork and in-ground landscaping to really soften that transition between um, the sidewalk and the, the parking areas or to soften kind of the, the building as it relates to the street. We're also thinking about ways to offset some of the negative uh, consequences of above grade parking described earlier. So where above grade parking facilities are necessary, they're encouraged to in incorporate green roofs, solar panels, or open space amenities on the top deck to benefit the community and the environment. And again, as Ken mentioned, you know, the, the, this is a statement coming from our city planning commission. So it has kind of the weight and gravitas of our city planning commission, but this is not codified. So we just wanna be clear about that. Um, projects providing above grade parking are also encouraged to provide more than the minimum of code required EV parking stalls. So currently 30% um, of total parking stalls must be EV ready. And we're saying that if above grade parking is provided, that number needs to go up. Um, and in the next few slides, I'll go over some of the new components of the advisory that were adapted from our latest best practices uh, coming out of our new zoning code and the work in downtown Los Angeles in particular. So the first is parking screening. Um, so what you're seeing on, on the screen here is um, some excerpts from our new zoning code. Um, here we've modified the advisory to recommend architectural screening that is um, first and foremost, you know, integrated with the overall design expression of the building and also achieves a performance of 60% opacity. And to help visualize what 60% opacity might look like, here's a section view through the parking structure. So you have a screen, you've got the parking behind the screen, and the parking is using some sort of perforated material, like in this photo of a project under construction along Wilshire Boulevard um, that uses perforated metal panels to prevent light spillover. And the higher the opacity, the more solid area there is in relation to the openings or perforations. So rather than a solid wall, we're recommending 60% opacity. Um, we know that there are kind of trade-offs as far as mechanical ventilation versus, you know, airflow that occur. But um, if the primary concern is screening lights, this is um, what we feel this is kind of the best practice. Um, the next one I'm going to talk about is parking wrapping. So um, here we've provided, we've, we've bolstered the former parking advisory with more specificity in how to achieve screening of parking by encouraging parking wrapping. And what this means is that parking uses are still in the upper floors of the building, but um, the, these parking areas are wrapped with active uses um, to a minimum depth of 15 feet from the building frontage. And what this does is that, you know, it renders the parking pretty much imperceptible from the main facade. So you can have above grade parking, but um, it's done in a way that is um, discreetly wrapped with active uses. Um, then the what happens is that the by default, the parking entrances are pushed back further into the depths of the building and they're not um, you know, closer to the street and intersections. And another advantage here is that on larger lots, um, what when you start to wrap the building frontage, the ground floor um, is becomes the prominent um, building entryway. And so parking is pushed back, entrances are pushed back, and the pedestrian realm is activated. And what this really does is then it creates continuity and activity 
in the ground floor uses and space for street trees without the interruption of driveway curb cuts. The last method I'm going to talk about is adaptable parking structures. And our city planning commission was very interested in you know, taking a closer look at strategies to facilitate the future adaptive reuse of parking areas um, for beneficial uses, especially, you know, when we're in such a housing crisis and, you know, just seeing um, entire floor levels dedicated to parking. So um, the above grade parking advisory recommends incorporating some design measure measures when the building is at its earliest stages of you know, conceptual design and um, as it's being engineered to allow for areas to be converted into, um, into alternative uses in the future. So the first method is that um, floor plates are required to be level, um, except to the extent required for um, drainage and ramps between levels. So we know that there's going to be a need for elevator banks and ramps um, but what we're saying is that the floor plates, um, aside from those areas, excluding those areas, are, um, are to be designed uh, to be flat so that they can be more readily converted in the future. Uh, the next thing is that the structure should be designed to accommodate occupant loads associated with office building corridors above the first floor. Um, and what this does is it ensures that, you know, the stairs and corridors are properly placed to meet egress requirements for fire and life safety so that the entire building doesn't need to be retrofitted to make it adaptable. And lastly, that floor to floor heights have to be a minimum of 11 feet. And this is to ensure a finished ceiling height of nine feet in new inhabited spaces after the conversion. So again, designing with this future conversion in mind and with these um, simple you know, tools and interventions, uh, we think that this will make it easier and also educate um, property owners on how this can be done. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit as we conclude about some of the challenges and opportunities here that um, are presented. So, you know, changing the mindset of developers and community members with respect to the av availability of high quality transit is, um, is always a challenge. You know, we hear from community groups that, you know, they don't see the rail, even though Metro is building out our regional rail network, there's still this perception that infrastructure is years and years away and that even when it's here, people in LA just won't use transit. So really kind of um, going up against some of those, um, you know, perceptions about the need for parking and not only the need for minimum parking, but sometimes above and beyond even what the code requires. Um, and then we also hear uh, from architects and developers that they would love to reduce parking in their project, but that they're hearing from their clients that the project won't pencil out if parking isn't readily available or that lenders will back away from the project. So um, we, we certainly hear that concern often. Um, and being a large city, we you know, when it comes to developing policy, we often grapple with the, the chicken and egg dilemma of whether to address um, a topic such as, as this big policy topic of parking at the neighborhood scale first, or taking it on um, citywide as a, as a citywide issue. And each has its pros and cons, um, but, you know, we're a city of 15 council districts, so it can often be challenging to, um, you know, uh, take on a light, lightning rod issue like this one citywide. And we've attempted to in the past. Um, and the new zoning code represents a fundamental shift and an opportunity to really um, develop projects around the desired form rather than having parking dictate design. And this is something I'm very excited about. We work closely with our um, our code studies team and our um, 
our team working on the new zoning code and its integration. And we're optimistic that um, we really have an opportunity here to use form districts and some of our newer zoning tools through our community plan program that Ken touched on. Um, and this really gives us the ability to work with stakeholders uh, to address many of these longstanding parking issues. And, you know, we're hopeful that we'll continue to make progress um, at all levels, both neighborhood scale and citywide. And with that, uh, that concludes our presentation and Ken and I are available for any questions. Great, thank you, Ken and Michelle. Uh, do we have any questions from the group uh, for Ken and Michelle right now? Hi, Hi. go ahead, Elise. Hi, yes, Elise Swanson, um, San Pedro Chamber of Commerce. And um, I do have a question. We are grappling with, um, we have a very um, vital and energetic and historic downtown San Pedro, but we're beginning to grapple with um, new residential projects being opened in our community in the downtown with unbundled parking and some unintended consequences of residents of the apartment buildings taking commercial parking in the downtown area um, because um, our um, apartment um, owners are charging $65 a month to park in the apartment buildings. So it's cheaper for some of the residents in their mind just to take street parking immediately adjacent to our, our, um, our commercial area. So any advice for us? We're actually going to convene a meeting with the chamber, our business improvement district, and the council office to come up with some strategies to address this issue. Thanks, Elise. Yeah, good to see you. And th thanks for the question. Um, I guess I would start and Michelle can jump in by suggesting that um, while perhaps the, uh, the parking demand uh, was initially created by what, what you're saying in terms of unbundled parking, that you probably need to take a comprehensive approach to parking management in the district and really looking at the intersection of the commercial and residential uses. Um, you know, if uh, residents are parking in commercial areas, I mean, you may wanna look at how that parking is priced time limitations on uh, on that parking, because obviously the the hours, you know, residences are uh, needing to park uh, for a different duration and uh, often at different times than uh, the commercial uses. So I think the advice might be that you really need kind of a comprehensive uh, parking management strategy. I think City of Beaumont's presentation might give you some uh, good tips as well, because I think that's uh, from what I know about what they're going to speak about next. They're looking at that type of more comprehensive approach and probably San Pedro would benefit from that. Thank you. Great. Any other questions for the city of LA at this moment? There will be another opportunity to ask all of our panelists at the very end as well. Um, but yeah, if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand or drop it in the chat. I'll give it a minute to see if we do have anyone. Uh, seeing none at the moment, uh, we'll continue with the presentation, but as a reminder, at the very end, we'll also have a, a, a chance and opportunity for the whole group to answer, uh, to ask all of our panelists questions as well. So, uh, with that, uh, thank you, Michelle and Ken. Um, I'm happy to introduce our next, uh, group of presenters. Um, let me move on to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, next up, we have Walker Associates and the City of Beaumont. Um, Christine Taylor is the Deputy City Manager of the City of Beaumont. Uh, her team helps implement the city's vision and goals for community development and land use. Her team provides comprehensive information and recommendations to ensure that development projects are of the highest possible quality. Having a breadth of experience spanning both short-term and long-range projects and extensive CEQA involvement, she has the skills and ability necessary to help her team be successful. She has a master's degree in public policy from California State University, San Bernardino, a master's of arts from Southeast Missouri State University, and a BA in geography from California State University, San Bernardino. And from Walker Associates, we have Stefan Taroff. Uh, Stefan has managed over 60 municipal parking planning 
operational and financial engagements in California, and many others across the country, focusing on solutions that may be operational, multimodal when possible, and code-based before turning to capital-intensive solutions. His recent engagements have focused on planning residential parking permit programs and multifamily housing, looking for parking and transportation related solutions to have the housing crisis. He is actively engaged in consensus building uh, among dis de um, uh, disparate stakeholders uh, to win approval from city, county, and state government agencies. Stefan has a master's in urban planning from UCLA, where he studied with parking expert uh, Professor Donald Shoup. Subsequently, Stefan has a planner of uh, at, was a planner at Gilmore Associates in Los Angeles, the firm that championed the city's adaptive reuse ordinance, which allows for the conversion of historic buildings into multifamily uses. The firm is credited with sparking the residential renaissance in Los Angeles historic core, uh, in part through parking planning related solutions. So now I will hand it over to Christina and Stefan for their presentation on the parking management plan. Thanks, Lyle. Um, Christina Taylor from the city of Beaumont. Um, Stefan and I are going to take turns going through the slideshow, um, talking about our uh, process in the city of Beaumont, um, where uh, Walker was engaged to prepare a parking management plan. Um, so what you see on the screen there is the Beaumont Civic Center, which since this picture has been taken has had a little bit of a facelift, but it's essentially the anchor of our downtown and it serves as our city hall and um, community meeting space, etc. cetera. Um, we, we sought to address um, parking issues downtown specifically, um, but also citywide. So in 2018, 19, we were in the middle of um, preparing our general plan update. And part of that general plan update included a downtown area plan. Um, the idea with the general plan as a whole and, and specifically with the downtown area plan was that we wanted to promote economic development throughout the city. Um, Beaumont is, is in Western Riverside County, but we're pretty far east out off of the 10 freeway, um, about 30 miles from Palm Springs. And over the last 10 years or so, we've experienced tremendous residential growth. So we went from a population of about 38,000 um, to about 54,000, um, which is where we sit today. So we had we had seen the residential growth, but we really wanted to focus on um, economic development. And so in order to do that, um, we had we had been working through the general plan process. We'd been taking feedback from stakeholders, business owners, residents, um, and we knew there were some issues with parking. Um, it felt like we had enough parking, but for some reason, it just wasn't working well. And in the downtown area, um, which is which is pretty old, we have a lot of parcels that had um, you know inadequate parking for uses that were. Um, per the code for uses that were taking taking place there. So we really needed some strategies and some help on how to, um, how to address these issues. So you see on the screen, we have um, sort of your typical suburban um, shopping center, like Walmart, Superstore, Best Buy, Home Depot, et cetera. Um, this has since developed out fully now, is, is completely built out. But um, with your typical, um, you know, parking standards of, you know, so many parking spaces per square foot for retail and restaurant, et cetera. And then on the other side, you see our downtown area, which um, has both some residential and some commercial. And we do have some street parking, but um, again, it just, everything wasn't functioning in a way that we thought that it, that it should function. So, and we saw the SCAD grant opportunity and planning staff felt like this might be a good idea to um, try and address parking issues in the downtown. And granted, we did want to look at citywide because our code is fairly old. So our, our last comprehensive code update was in 2007. So our code's about 15 years old, and with the exception of consistency updates that were done as part of the general plan process. So we knew we needed we needed to look at it. Um, businesses were struggling to find sites with adequate parking. Um, staff was struggling with how to help businesses occupy existing spaces um, without, you know, via, directly violating the code. 
Um, and we had no real structure or um, options for anything but on-site parking. And so um, ultimately we decided we would apply for um, the SCAD grant and a parking management plan was likely gonna be the solution um, or at least the foundational um, step that we needed in order to look at parking um, throughout the city, but also um, in the downtown to really promote um, economic development and to encourage walkability, change the streetscape essentially, and really make downtown a place um, that's vibrant and, and that people want it to be. So here you see um, sort of a, a map of our downtown area plan. Um, we have um, our main street, Beaumont Avenue, which runs north-south, and there's um, an exit off of Interstate 10. And then we have 6th Street, which is our core that runs east-west, um, basically the length of the city. And so the area shown on the screen is essentially our um, our focus area for downtown with the green and the darker blue areas being sort of the, the core. And, and what we found through um, Walker's study, which I, I think Stefan will get more into, is that we actually do have a high availability of parking overall throughout the city um, and also even in the downtown area. But there are concentrated areas that have higher needs than others, um, particularly in the downtown. Thank you, Christina. Can I, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so it, it's interesting to hear, you know, about the city of LA where, where I live and work so much of the time. And then you know, most of the Skag region, which looks a lot like Beaumont. So, you know, for example, when we look at the code, um, so, or we think about parking and, you know, citywide, typically, you know, these days we're looking at these traditional, um, a need for or desire for walkable commercial districts like Christina was just referring to, you know, with a goal of park once and, you know, have that civic identity, you know, like with the civic center, the, the um, city hall. Um, but then so much commercial area is, you know, typically these large commercial centers uh, with multiple tenants, um, which also have you know, very often you'll have citywide the same parking regulations governing both, although, you know, there's movement to that downtown area uh, to separate that out through specific plans, that type of thing. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in Beaumont. And then, you know, I think the code is really typically geared for standalone commercial businesses. Um, you know, the idea that that a store or a restaurant is on its own parcel and that the code is requiring parking on that parcel. And more and more in Southern California, that's, I think, the exception rather than the rule. And yet uh, so many businesses and property owners are forced to navigate providing parking in that type of, um, with that type of regulation. Um, so each of these three really has different needs, but similar principles apply. Uh, for the city-wide parking management plan, um, we wanted to, to recognize that all three of these are different, but you know we'll talk about sharing parking um, and and getting the parking right size is really key. So the findings, as Christina alluded to, um, in the areas we studied, and we we studied a wide swath of, of Beaumont, you know, five thousand surplus parking spaces, nearly forty acres. That's obviously a big number. Um, not so exceptional, though. We see plenty of cities, you know, we all say everyone needs parking. Okay, you know, we're, we're, um, we're heavily auto-dependent, but, you know, how much? Obviously, in different places, we were just referring to downtown Los Angeles, um, you know, Beaumont, um, you know, the Santa Monica's, the, um, the San Bernardino's, every, along the new Goal Line extension. You know, the question is really right-sizing it. How much is enough? And typically, as, as Ken and Michelle were saying, um, the code has really burdened us with far too much parking. So, you know, what we found in Beaumont is some smaller businesses um, had commercial lots which didn't have enough spaces for code or maybe even, uh, you know, to function. But that's not a reason, you know, to maintain uh, the existing requirement or certainly not to increase it as often, you know, um, as these areas become more popular, there's pressure to do so. So, you know, there's as just about with every study we find, there's always available parking spaces nearby. It's how you access them, how you allow for that per the code. Um, 
to supply those who need, you know, those parcels, those businesses that need the parking. You know, I'll just give an example. Almost even the busiest cities, um, the Santa Monica's, the, the Carmel's of the world, when we look at a peak demand, you know, summer weekend or uh, you know, lunchtime on a weekday, I think pretty standard for some reason, we see 65% occupancy in a commercial district. And that's the busy places, which means that we see a third of the spaces, even during the busiest times, empty. And meanwhile, you know, we have these parking requirements that are saying, oh, you want more business? You know, build more. Uh, you know, you develop more housing, build more parking. But we know there's that third of parking sitting out there um, from a code perspective and from an operational perspective. We want to tap that. So here's something else I think that, you know, comes up so often. We're um, contacted by, by uh well, developers or you know city staff, and they say, you know, what are our justifications for reducing parking requirements? Um, gee, you know, Lyft and Uber are changing mode share, um, which is true. You know, for example, in the in the hospitality industry, um, that's swinging back a little bit, but still, that's been a difference. Um, more people are biking, walking, scooters. Um, in some places, that has been a difference. Increasing transit access, like I mentioned, you know, the Gold Line extension, you know, Expo Line recently coming the west side, Santa Monica, we have looked at some of those for new development. So sometimes these are justifications, but really, and this might be the tough one to communicate to the public sometime who's you know dealing with parking issues, usually parking requirements, as, as all the previous speakers have said, are just too darn high to begin with. So, so often we're asked, you know, you know go out there, let's, let's see what the data on uh, TNCs, on Lyft and Uber are saying, or, you know, transit ridership, let's, you know, Let's look at, you know, how many people are walking the bike mode, uh, bicycle modes, you know, scooters these days. And those are important. But the harder thing to communicate is, is sometimes is just to say, look, the parking requirements are too high to begin with. So we can collect all this data, but, you know, we may find that, that you know, we need that reduction anyway for all the reasons, you know, uh, to spur business and to, you know, create more housing that have been mentioned. So, you know, the challenges and solutions in, in Beaumont um, Again, reserved parking. When you reserve parking, and this is true for residential and for commercial, you need more spaces um, because you have spaces that are sitting there empty by definition a lot of the time. Um, so we wanted to get away from that. We wanted to encourage sharing. Um, sharing spaces means you need fewer spaces. It's more efficient. It's more walkable. Um, that the parking that you do have, you know, you can narrow, you can shrink it down, and that makes for just you know there are some illusion. Um, discussion of playmaking, that's so important. Um, like I said, really every commercial parking district has excess parking. Um, a few years ago, we were looking at a, at a district in Long Beach, one of the fullest I've seen. Um, and yet still, you looked at some of the private parking supply, um, there are well over a hundred spaces there. You know, you'll find the private supply almost always have availability. Doesn't mean you can always tap it, but rather than look at requiring more parking or building more parking, we want to see what we can do here. And that's some of the recommendations that we provided to Beaumont. Um, and last but not least, you know, where we have high demand for parking, low demand for parking, which probably everyone on this call has seen. Um, and what do we hear about from constituents, you know, that, you know, where parking is in high demand, there's little availability. Um, we are going to have to manage the street. And, you know, Don Shoup has, he's been so um, effective and, and, and you know his message, I think, has come through loud and clear. And we're seeing a lot of reductions or eliminations from parking requirements. But Don also talks about managing the street. And sometimes it's easier to reduce the parking requirements, uh, especially in some of these you know smaller cities, suburban cities, than turn to well, you know, we may need to put some time limits out there. We may need to enforce. Um, not even talking about paid parking, which is appropriate in some busy places, maybe less so in others. Um, but when we when we work with reducing parking requirements, we are going to have to manage the street. So getting back to the parking manage master, management master plan, just one thing, you know, I was so happy to hear and, and that I learned from Christina, um, you know, I think parking was at one point so siloed from other modes. You know, it was just looked at um, in an engineering perspective, how many spaces do we need? I think now we look more at multimodal, but as Christina was telling me, you know, as horrible as the pandemic has been, looking at parking as a land use in and of itself, a destination, the highest and best use, and not just saying this is our parking plan, 
I'll let you take over, Christina, but I thought that was that was <laughs> very meaningful to me to say how the city then began to look at, at um, updating its plans. Right. Thanks, Stefan. So yeah, Stefan and I have had numerous conversations about this and it's pretty exciting. So, you know, the parking management master plan, um, even going into this, I was thinking, okay, parking is just parking. It's an, it's an issue we have to deal with in land development. It's something we, you know, we struggle with too much, not enough, just like we've heard um, discussed previously on this, on this meeting. Um, but what happened after the parking management plan was adopted, um, you know, we were essentially in COVID. So the, the, manage, the, the parking master plan sat and we didn't really do anything with it. Um, we had updated our, our general plan and the downtown area plan was adopted by council. Um, it was the end of 2020, it took effect early 2021. Fortunately, we were going through the parking management master plan at the same time as, as we were working on the general plan update. So we were able to take some of the information from the parking study and incorporate those into the, the goals and policies of the general plan update. So we have things like, you know, managing, um, managing the public parking facilities, um, you know, looking at opportunities for shared parking and some things that we didn't already have included in our existing general plan and the zoning code. So it was exciting to see that, um, that we were able to incorporate that and that the timing worked out so well for us. But again, being in COVID, everything just sat. Well, you know, we're we're far out of the um, urban area. We're we're very suburban, surrounded by some rural um, some rural areas as well. And what we saw during COVID was very interesting. So our our businesses here, you know, we wanted them to succeed. We were working um, with all the agencies and funding available to help our, our businesses stay afloat and providing them any opportunity and assistance we could to, you know, make it through the pandemic. And what we saw were businesses began to utilize their, um, their parking areas for outdoor seating and for, um, you know, putting up canopies or, or tents. They were, um, in some cases, you know, putting out uh, flex spaces or, you um, I wouldn't say anything went permanent, but some some seating was there for very long term. Some was able to be configured, you know, differently. And, um, you know, initially I was like, oh, my gosh, what are they doing? They're taking up the parking. But as we saw that it really um, it was successful and the businesses were having people come out and people were enjoying being able to sit and be socially distanced, but still partake in, you know, something that was quasi normal, even in such a weird time. And so I think that really spurred us um, in the planning department to think about, okay, as COVID wound down and things started to return back to whatever normal is for your relative areas, um, we thought, you know, our our downtown area plan and our goals and policies and our general plan really are on point with changing the changing the streetscape and bringing the walkability and allowing businesses to utilize the space um, that they have in a way that makes sense and in a way that's attractive to the community that makes people want to. Um, makes people want to go down and, and participate in whatever the business is offering. So fast forward now to um, end of 2021, early 2022, we're working on the budget and um, we have been talking with our economic development committee on um, council's vision for the downtown. And council really um, gave us a lot of input into the downtown area plan and they really have captured that vision well and have run with it. And so um, in the spring of 2022, we held a, a downtown business meeting, sort of an informal um, event at one of our breweries. And that meeting was sort of spurred out of previous conversations at the Economic Development Committee where businesses were coming to talk about issues they're having with parking. And then that spiraled into, you know, other other issues and and we says hey wait we have tools and plans in place not just the parking management plan but now a downtown area plan and a new general plan that's going to allow us to help um, spur this economic development and so 
we held a meeting downtown at one of the um, the breweries, and it was very well attended, probably in the neighborhood of sixty ish people, and which for us is is huge. Um, just for perspective, I think we had maybe five or six people show up to the public hearing for the general plan update. So, um, you know, people were really interested in this downtown. Um, activity and conversations that were taking place. So we received a lot of good feedback and that has continued to focus our efforts on um, not just addressing parking, but um, looking at parking in the whole scheme of economic development and how an area functions. So um, we're very fortunate that our city council allocated um, economic development department um, uh, close to a million dollars for this fiscal year to um, continue working on issues downtown, um, coming up with a revitalization plan that will continue to build on our downtown area plan, um, giving us the tools that we need to address the parking and to look at the recommendations that Walker came up with for us. And we're now thinking about things that maybe we hadn't ever thought of in the past, like a parking in lieu or, um, you know, shared parking, city-sponsored parking, all kinds of things have come out of this. So um, it was really exciting um, to participate in this parking master plan opportunity through SCAG, not knowing what it would turn into, but um, extremely excited about the conversations that it has spurred and the tools that it's given us to, to build on and how it's helped change our perspective on how we look at um, parking in relationship to um, to other uses and to um, cities functioning as a whole. I mean, I'm thinking about so many things, uh, Christina and, and Ken, Michelle, as you were speaking. Um, we have a senior parking engineer here, Mary Smith. Uh, she's been here for 48 years and she is a, a, um, an engineer. And she always says, you know, the destination is the draw, parentheses, not the parking. Um, so parking, of course, is important. Often it's crucial. Um, but again, this, you know, when uh, Christine and I were speaking, the idea that don't keep it too siloed, you know, what is the big picture of what you want your downtown to look like? Not necessarily how many spaces, I think is, you know, coming from, you know, sort of a parking design engineering planning company, that is that is crucial. And I think, you know, again, as, as awful as so much happened, of what happened in the pandemic, you know, this idea to reimagine these spaces and parking, I think, has been really productive. Um, even just a side note, you know, when we look at parking spaces sort of being, quote unquote, taken over, um, you know, and we worry about additional demand, you know, should is there even more parking needed? And to see how, you know, for example, um, kitchen size, I had, you know, a traffic engineer was I was talking to and, you know, is, is kitchen size, you know, more of a determinant rather than seating? Um, as to how many people you can serve. Um, but ultimately, you know, you want people downtown, you want people in your commercial districts, and, and that has been, you know, so important. So just going back to the parking management plan, um, you know, we say revisit and reduce parking requirements where necessary. Um, very often we are engaged by cities or um, their constituents to look at parking requirements, often with the expectation that, you know, we will recommend they go up. Um, I have not seen that happen. Um, you know, typically parking requirements, of course, land use by land use, there are differences, but you know, typically they're oversized. Um, at the same time, you know, we do see numbers 10 or 20 per thousand for restaurant. Um, but do you really want to require that? Uh, you know, that that can and will be a killer for opening, you know, new food and beverage. So you, again, you want to be careful about that. Um, the other thing, as I alluded to before. Share, share, sharing, parking. Um, at the outset, Lyle was talking about housing. Um, we've worked on a number of multifamily uh, big projects uh, coming in after the fact where, you know, we hear too little parking was, was required or provided for this multifamily. And we go in there and there really is plenty of parking, but it's been reserved unit by unit by unit. It may even be in a pool, you know, in a central parking garage or, or soft service lot and people are pretty law abiding and you know the, there'll be one unit that has three cars and then maybe a number of other units that has one car or zero cars but the way the parking is allocated creates spillover a a demand for more spaces so and so often you know a parking requirement is so rigid so inflexible 
Um, and of course, every restaurant is different, every store, every apartment. Um, the more you can share, the more you can balance all that out. And that's one thing, again, we saw in, in Beaumont, some parcels, you know, restaurant owner we talked to, you know, needed a lot more parking. And yet, you know, two, um, two parcels down, there was plenty of parking, but the current structure of the code at that time did not allow him to simply engage. Um, he did, he was successful ultimately, but he said that was complicated. Can we make it easier for future businesses? Um, so that's really, I think, a big part of what we're looking at. Um, and like I said, on the street, um, in busy areas, you might find a need for paid parking. Um, some of your cities already have that. It helps you manage. But can we have time limits or similar restrictions? Uh, you know, I heard um, Ms. Swanson from, from San Pedro, you know, how is overnight parking regulated for residents? Um, we do need, as, as things get denser in Southern California, you know, our land is in such high demand, we need more housing, we need to, you know, some nuance, some finesse in some of that. Um, parking in Luffy's, I, I think, you know, they actually vary by state. We're talking in California today. Um, there's a lot of flexibility, I think, in terms of what you can do with them to shape your district. Um, it doesn't have to be massive fees to build massive structures. You can use them. Um, we've talked a lot about transit accessible, you know, residential or development. But I, from everything I've heard from residents, developers, constituents, cities, um, like Christine was saying, that walkability is so key. And when you improve your walkability and sidewalks, you effectively improve your parking because it makes parking that may not have been that accessible, uh, more accessible, and therefore you need less of it. So um, all of these things, I think, you know, it's a comprehensive approach, um, reducing the requirements, sharing, address what's going on on the street. Um, I see a question in, in the box. Um, no, Beaumont does not have meter parking. Um, and we did examine that. And we thought, you know, Beaumont is not there yet. Uh, and may never be there. Um, so, but all of those, you know, of a time limit, metered parking, parking permits, residential parking districts, are all part of the same thing and tools um, in the toolbox, like we're talking about today, to, to manage that parking. Because when you don't, and it's a free for all, um, it gets very inefficient. And so the, the, defa the default perception, I think traditionally how cities have been planned or engineers is let's just build more. But when you build more, you're always going up, going down at great expense, going out, but, rare, but usually, People just want parking at the front door, and that is finite. Um, so we do have to manage it. That's where management comes in. So, Lyle, I don't know the extent to which we have time for questions, but we're also happy to answer questions. Yeah, yeah, we have uh, the remaining 25 minutes uh, to go over some questions. Um, there have been a few that were dropped into the uh, chat box. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Kin and Michelle also to, um, you know, if they want to turn their cameras on. Uh, because I think this is just a great opportunity to have uh, a conversation. Uh, and, and while some might have the answer, some might not, uh, I think this is a great opportunity for everyone. So um, one of the questions we did have uh, get dropped into the chat uh, was from Paul Samaras uh, from the city of El Segundo. Uh, he asked, how do you convince a city that has no metered parking to go down that path? I'll take a stab at that one. If uh, I've been in front of many council or, or neighborhood district, to me, always the short answer is when the pain of finding a space is less than the pain of paying a dollar or two, that's when you start paying for parking. When you know, when you're when you or others are, are driving around saying, Oh gosh, you know, I would I would pay a little money for parking. You know, we've gone into cities that that looked at, you know, we want to fund this or want to fund that. And and on, you know, Don Chip will talk about this. What do you need funded? And that's very important. Um, but the demand has to be there. And people have to see value for their money. And I think um, there, for most of us, when, you know, with congestion and frustration, um, I think we typically you want to show or ask the public, you know, is it worth it? We can, we can put out two hour time limits and slam people with 50 or $60 tickets right after that, which is awful for anybody, for a resident, for people working at their residence or for, you know, customers, especially, they will never come back, understandably or they can pay a dollar or two, or in some cases three, um, and maybe not have a time limit. But I think that's the way to think about, and to start to think about implementing paid parking, which is challenging, but you know, does provide a lot of benefits. 
Great. Does uh, Ken, Michelle, or Christina want to add anything to that? Um, I just want to respond to um, a comment that was made earlier, a question that came up about, um, you know, what happens when there's spillover parking in commercial areas. Um, I think it's important, as Stefan and, and Christina were discussing, it's important to kind of look at the issue from a district scale and a shared parking scenario, because what you don't want to end up having is a situation where you're pitting um, residential uses or users against um, commercial property owners and, and tenants of commercial property because um, these are all community members. And, you know, I think um, there's a way as, as Stefan was showing, you know, with um, looking at demand management to perhaps fit both needs in a community. So I uh, just wanted to mention that, you know, the issue of the ADUs being converted, um, that is consistent with state law um, because, you know, we're really trying to get every unit that we can um, built as, as housing. Um, and so, the but I think, you know, the parking issue and where parking goes is also important. We just need to make sure that we're not, you know, um, like scapegoating the housing or the, um, you know, one, one part of the equation. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Elise, did you have a question for the group? No, I think, Michelle, I think what happened to us is our community is very supportive of new housing development, but I we should have had our parking management plan in place first. I think that's that's our regret. So we're trying to figure out how to balance all this out. And what we're finding is our parking is so inexpensive, it's a dollar an hour, that you know people are using that for long-term parking instead of there being a churn for the um, you know, businesses and a turnover. So that's kind of what we're grappling with is just how to how to price out parking so we can get that turnover and manage, as Stefan, as you said, and manage the street parking. Um, so um yeah, great discussion. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you, Elise. Um, we did have another question in the chat. Um, so Carlos uh, wants to know, is there a way to incentivize property owners who get construction flexibility uh, to not charge for on-street parking? I don't know if anyone has a response to that or if, if uh, well, Carlos wanted to elaborate more or. I, I think what he's asking, it says to charge for on-site parking, meaning, you know, on the one hand, from a policy perspective, we see, you know, the unbundling of parking where parking is so expensive to construct and, and Michelle or, or Ken, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, you know, that policy idea that you want people to only pay for the parking they need, um, but then there is, the potential for people to say in some instances, oh, you know, I'm not going to pay $65 or $100 per space. I'm just going to park on the street. Um, and that's a challenging one. I think, it, uh, you know, that's where, you know, the cities I think that have, you know, allowed or even required unbundling of parking typically have more management on the street. So as to say, you know, okay, you can park on the street, but there's a permit or there's, you know, there's a fee. You know, the, it's a differential between the cost on the street and the cost in, in the garage that, that triggers the spillover very often. Um, so I think, you know, for the property owners, the property owners are getting mixed messages these days. Um, you know, I think they often, you know, for the market, even where they are charging for space, typically it's first space free, second space they charge for. Um, but I think, you know, as, as has been mentioned a few times here, where the problem is the street, the first thing to do is address the street. And if, if depending on what property owners do or not, I think the first thing to do is to say, okay, there is a cost or there is a regulation. Everybody just can't park on the street regardless of what property owners are doing. Um, I think that's a bigger policy question as to what they're doing, uh, because I think often they're incentivized to do that in more and more places. And I just, um, I just wanted to kind of mention um, an example we've seen in some of our commercial mixed use projects um, where developers have um, provided more than the minimum required parking spaces. Sometimes we will 
require them to provide the additional parking to businesses that are in the community. So I've seen that um, placed as a condition on new development. If they're already going above the minimum, that those aren't just going to unused guest parking spaces for the residents, for example, but they're actually serving the, um, the commercial district that they're in. Great, thank you, Michelle. Um, we have a question from Lawrence uh, who asks, where is LA in reducing or removing parking requirements or having a parking uh, or having a parking maximums? I'll start, Michelle, you can uh, correct me if I get this wrong or, or forget anything. I, yeah, I touched in my present, first portion of the presentation on some of the areas where we have removed parking requirements, uh, kind of starting with our adaptive reuse ordinance in downtown that Stefan had a lot of experience with. And I think that was tremendously successful um, in the downtown area going further now as well with um, building upon that with the downtown LA 2040 plan. We've had some specific plan areas, some of which I I mentioned where we've also removed parking requirements. We have the, the cornfield, the Royal Seco um, specific plan, other areas where we've reduced um, uh, or eliminated uh, uh, minimum parking requirements. You know, we're a really large city, so it's it's tough to remember all of our, uh, you know, parking reforms. And I'm not immediately coming up with, Michelle, whether we have done a, uh, a new parking maximum uh, in any of our plans. Um, not a, uh, not that I'm aware of, but I think some of our more kind of localized specific plans do have uh, maximums. But again, um, each of those really look at parking demand at a very localized level, like, um, you know, like the city of Beaumont. So um, it would be the equivalent of that doing a parking demand study and then adjusting the parking requirements accordingly. Right, thank you. Uh, Rick wants to know, uh, has the growth of the rideshare industry and future of autonomous vehicles been factored into parking strategies? I'll jump in really quickly. Uh, I looked at this, and as I mentioned, I think, you know, in Uber, um, I was working with, uh, with a colleague who works a lot in transit, and I was saying, boy, you know, Lyft and Uber are just taking over everything. And he said a few years ago, but, you know, transit is subsidized and Lyft and Uber are subsidized. And one of these days, that's, you know, are those, are they going to be subsidized forever? Um, and so I think what we're seeing is, is a pulling back. Um, you know, we've done some big plans for hotels in particular, where absolutely the, the, that has changed things. I think urban, urban residential, that has changed things also. Um, autonomous vehicles are a whole other ball game. We have um, done work in places like Silicon Valley will do, where they will say, um, you know, design for just three quarters of what you want because we think AVs are going to take over, you know, a quarter. But I think, you know, AVs, if you look historically, have been predicted as just around the corner for so long and have their own problems. They're still cars. They're still traffic. Some ways even worse because they're deadheading on the street like uh, Uber and Lyft. So I think very often we do look at that. Um, I think, you know, Uber and Lyft, Rideshare more than others, and it has helped. But like I said, you know, I'm sort of partial to good old walkability, bikeability um, of a district and, and better transit service, I think in the long term is more of a determining factor. Um, so it, it depends, it depends on the site and the district. But I think we tend to overly put our confidence in those for solutions. Um, that's my, my personal opinion, just on the research that I've seen. We should take into account, but more often than not, when we look at it, it's fallen a little flat. And I think overall, that comprehensive planning of a walkable multimodal district is the best thing we can do. Um, dare I say, rather than overly rely on the technology. I would just add to that, um, you know, it gets back to what Stefan was saying about managing the street and, uh, and in this case, kind of allocating sidewalk uh, and uh, street frontage. Um, you know, I think there is greater thinking about uh, the rideshare industry and uh, loading and unloading, drop-offs, pickups, um, and how that relates to on-street parking and, uh, you know, uh, managing the sidewalk and the street in such a way that it enables all of that type of uh, um, you know mobility strategy, 
Um, it, it requires thinking about that sidewalk and street space in a, in a very different way. And this also gets us thinking about changing technology. And we've had some the beginnings of some interesting conversations in the city of Los Angeles about, in addition to autonomous vehicles, urban air mobility um, and uh, uh, you know aerial transportation and how that will uh, affect uh, mobility comprehensively. I think one thing that's kind of interesting is that some of the early entrants into that space have been looking at, uh, at least in the Los Angeles area, rooftops of parking structures as um, potential uh, uh, heliports, es essentially, because they're already there, they're multi-story facilities. Um, so thinking about parking facilities uh, in connecting three-dimensionally into the air uh, and as well as the intersection of urban air mobility and uh, connectivity at ground level connection to other modes of transit, such as ride share, such as other, other modes of public transit, um, that adds a whole, uh, uh, you know, a, a whole other dimension to these, these conversations. Great. Um, we do have one final question, it looks like, uh, from Courtney, and this one is more focused towards the city of Beaumont. They asked, uh, did you change parking regulations for existing structures to allow for shared parking? Um, she asks because her jurisdiction uh, will list parking space counts on a certificate of occupancy, but uh, they have studies uh, that show they have more parking than they need, um, but it's not available because the spaces may be on the adjacent lot, but with different ownership and businesses there. Yeah, got it. Thanks, Courtney. Um, so we did not, or we have not yet officially change the parking regulations. Um, our council is, is pro-business and um, really wants to see um, businesses and buildings occupied, not vacant buildings. And so we have um, some policies in place that allow us to um, if if the zoning permits the use, then to allow the the business to occupy the structure, um, we do have um, shared parking policies in place. Um, we, in some cases, we have them um, formally established. In some cases, it's um, it's just by the nature of the way the lots are established or the way the development is laid out that the shared parking occurs. Um, in one particular case I can think of we actually did require a parking study and that was because there was going to be a significant change in use in one of our commercial areas this wasn't for the downtown this was um, I believe we were adding a movie theater to our downtown or to our commercial center as opposed to um, I think it was going to be a retail building before and so just because the the retail operates uh, much differently than a movie theater would. We wanted to make sure that the siting and the um, the arrangement of everything else existing wasn't going to be completely impacted. Um, but again, that's another shared parking situation. And we actually were able to allow the movie theater to go in without requiring any more parking. Um, it does get pretty full out there on a Friday or Saturday night, but um, there's been no complaints on shortage of parking, at least for, you know, for that area. And it's good for us and for our residents and for our council to see that, um, you know, the policies that they've adopted and the direction that they've given staff to allow these businesses to function um, and essentially, you know, determine whether whether or not they can occupy a certain location, um, even if there isn't enough parking by the code, has really um, led to us, I think, being um, successful in, and businesses growing and businesses continuing to come to our city. Great. Thank you, Christina. Uh, we did have one more question come through uh, from Linda. Uh, she asks, uh, uh, are developers receptive to the suggestion of having parking below grade since below grade parking is more expensive, uh, you know, due to additional grading? Sometimes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think it just, um, so much of this is like dictated by um, the setting of the project and, um, you know, what the kind of uh, the predominant kind of building type is there already, um, how, you know, how many levels they need to go subterranean, subterranean, I think is another factor. Um, you know, I think more and more developers are 
starting to understand that this is um, a priority for our city planning commission and so and our department. Um, and so I think we're seeing projects that are coming in with um, wrapped or underground parking, but you know, we, we also see um, a handful that are proposing multiple levels of above grade parking still. Great, thank you, Michelle. All right, uh, and with that, um, I wanna thank everyone for all of the great questions we've just had. Uh, and I'd also like to give a big virtual round of applause for all of our wonderful panelists uh, that, that took the time to speak with us all today. Um, so please give them a big thumbs up in the chat. Um, uh, so please, uh, if, if Jennifer's on, if she wants to share that last slide for us, um, if you'd like, uh, please uh, scan the screen to give us a quick uh, feedback on how we did today. Um, additionally, uh, when you registered for this event, um, we had two other toolboxes uh, listed on that register page. Uh, so I just wanna give a highlight to them. So if you're interested, uh, we do have two future toolbox trainings coming up. Uh, one on September 13th, which is focused on other residential, other two residential land use conversions. And then we have a CEQA 101 and the Connect SoCal PEIR on October 18th. Um, you can join our SCAG mailing list and you'll be notified when we do have uh, some of these trainings coming up. But with that, uh, I just want to say thank you to everyone for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at future toolbox trainings. Thank you. Thank you, Lyle. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. And uh, thanks again, Jennifer. My pleasure.